Welcome to All Grown Up Now, a tale of retail, relocation, revenge, reinvention, reckless behavior, really good clothes, indiscretion, infidelity, domestic violence, and one kidnapping. I'm Kenneth D. King, podcasting from my studio near Union Square in New York City. This podcast is another in a series of installments from a novel I wrote called All Grown Up Now, A Friendship in Three Acts, available on Amazon.com. It's the story of a small-town boy who dreams of being a grown-up and his journey to get there. Each week, you'll hear another installment of this story. I am pleased to announce that BearWorldMagazine.com will be one of the sponsors of all of the episodes going forward. In the last episode, Ken finishes the dress commission that plants the seed for his new business. Episode 13, Self-Employment Means Loving the Boss. The place, San Francisco. The time, mid-1984. From that humble beginning, making the mother of the bride dress for Mrs. Thames, I had realized that I could actually make money sewing. With that, I started on my journey to create a business for myself. Being in business for myself appealed to me for a variety of reasons. First, I'm not a good soldier. If I'm working for someone who I don't respect or who has less knowledge of the job, I'm their worst nightmare. I also make trouble when I'm bored at work. This is an offshoot of the respect issue. Generally, if I don't respect someone, it's usually because they're stupid or incompetent or don't challenge me enough in good ways. This pattern of behavior showed up early. That explains how I got fired from Wendy's Old Fashioned Hamburgers. Now, I was working for Carmel and realized that if I stayed in display at Macy's, I'd be doomed to working for people like him forever. The display training, however, was a valuable starting point. Like theater design, display deals in transitory illusions made to look more expensive and permanent than they really are. In display, the more skill sets one has, the better equipped one is to do the job. I learned a tremendous amount working with Donna Louise and Craig and added to my own abilities, and that gave me a range of technical skills to draw upon. What rankled me about working for Macy's was that I was restricted to the Macy's way, a stylistic vocabulary of what was and was not to be done in a display. I wanted to be a little more on the edge, a little more quirky. This was always a problem, as Macy's had already figured out their formula. So, the idea of being a designer was appealing to that side of me as well. Working for Mrs. Thames showed me what kind of work I liked to do. Evening clothes. I liked detail, the beading, I liked working with good fabrics, and I liked rich people. Or, more to the point, I liked that rich people could afford expensive clothes and I would provide them for them. In sewing, my shortcomings were in the area of fitting clothing to the body. So, I decided to make evening accessories, bags, hats, wraps, that didn't require any fitting at all. After conferring with my friend Julie, who was the accessories buyer at iMagnon, I decided that I would focus on cocktail hats. The TV show Dynasty was just big then, and Julie said that there wasn't an awful lot of talent in millinery, so I could make a name quickly. So that's what I started making. And this is where the display training and my sewing came in handy. I didn't have the money to go to school, so I decided to teach myself hat making. Having such a broad range of knowledge to draw upon enabled me to come up with ways of constructing them that eventually became my hallmark. Another hallmark was the black velvet box. I understood, from being in display, that presentation was an integral part of the product. If one had a wonderful product and a crummy package, one had a crummy product. But if one had a beautiful package for a beautiful product, it would elevate that product to another level. Also, from the technical standpoint, since I worked in display, I understood how to make the actual box. About the time I was exploring the new direction of being a hat designer, Macy's bought all the Liberty House stores, and Hated Auntie Bob was looking for display managers for them. 
He thought that he had me tucked away in Pleasanton, chomping at the bit to be a manager. All it would take was for him to grant me an audience, bestow the position upon me, and I would be sobbing with gratitude. Auntie Bob miscalculated. First of all, I realized that nobody in the company cared that Carmel was a nutcase. They had shanghaied him to Pleasanton from the downtown store because he was so odious and Pleasanton was the furthest point east at the time. I figured if the folks downtown were willing to have this person on the payroll, even though he didn't work and just cause grief, their standards weren't as high as they claimed. Still, I was torn. Stay with the sure thing or jump off into the unknown? I vacillated for days before my audience with Auntie Bob and drove Matt crazy with my back and forth, do I, don't I, do I, don't I, do I, don't I. I finally asked Matt what he thought. You'll never see a display manager for Macy's on the cover of Vanity Fair, was his response. And I had my answer. I, of course, would never tell him to his face, and it galls me that he gets credit for giving me the best bit of advice I ever got in deciding the course of my career. But... Matt distilled my desires for my career into one sentence, and it changed my life. Mark was encouraging and felt that I was making the right decision. On one of my visits over to Mark's place, we were talking about me going with Macy's as opposed to having my own business. I remarked that I seemed to be able to achieve a career goal in about six to nine months, and the Macy's display manager goal was happening in just a little over that time. Perhaps you need a higher goal, Mark said quietly. And with that sentence, Mark confirmed that my decision to break away from the sure thing was indeed what I needed to do. With all the work and agonizing that I was doing, I needed a little break. So Matt and I went down to my old neighborhood, Noe Valley. I'd had a hankering for soda bread from the Star Bakery on 29th and Church, and I was going to get me some. So there we were, standing in line to buy the soda bread. Suddenly, I felt from behind a powerful pair of hands clamp down on my shoulders, spin me around, throw me backwards, and plant a Hollywood screen kiss on me. Well, I felt dizzy and thought that Matt had somehow got inspired, which was always a good thing. But then... I felt the beard. Matt didn't have a beard. I opened my eyes and looked up. It was Ilya. Remember him? The motorcycle gang member who did stained glass? The one built like a solid rectangle of brick? I sure did. We were still in the clinch. He looked down and raspily said, Hi. Hi, I squeaked out. Still looking good. Thanks. And then I was painfully aware of another pair of eyes boring into the side of my skull. It was Matt, and he was steaming mad. Uh, Ilya, this is Matt. Matt, this is Ilya. I've mentioned it before. Ilya effortlessly lifted me back up and set me on my very unstable feet. He nodded to Matt. Good seeing you, he said. He gave me one last look over, grinned, and strode out, straddling his motorcycle, fired it up, and roared away. I calmly stepped up and bought my soda bread. We then walked out in silence. Matt was still steaming. Finally, he stopped walking, whirled around, and shouted, Who haven't you slept with in this city? The new arrivals. I responded. One day in early 1984, Mark announced that he and Vic were moving to Southern California. It was sudden, what a surprise, but Vic had signed on with a Japanese security company that had bought into the L.A. market and hired Vic to run the company. This was during the time when a lot of companies were being bought by the Japanese and then spectacularly and expensively run into the ground by crazy Americans. Remember Sony? It seemed to be a good career move for Victor, but I asked Mark why he had to go. He loved San Francisco, and I could see it was breaking his heart to leave. And he had just landed a spot on the Arts Commission that dealt with the permits for the street artists. 
I don't think it was a paying gig, but could have led to one. We had several conversations about how much he enjoyed walking around, meeting the street artists, and seeing their work. Again, there was a sense of two felons blowing town in a hurry, but there was one complication. Mark had to go back to Boston for some family event. I can't remember what the event was, but I believe it was a bar mitzvah for a nephew or some such thing. So, Mark had to make sure the truck was packed and ready, and while Vic was driving to their new place in Long Beach and unloading, Mark would go to Boston. When he flew back, he would then transfer to a plane headed for Long Beach. Mark asked me to go by their old place and collect the rest of the mail and meet him at the airport when he arrived. He would have a couple of hours between flights, I could drop off his mail, and we could have some time together. I looked especially fetching that evening. I wore my olive green Eisenhower jacket over a black turtleneck and tilted at a very becoming angle over my right eye, a cute matching hat that looked like a wool pie plate stuck onto a matching hat band, great shoes, good gloves, and a pair of high-waisted battleship gray wool pleated trousers completed this look. I met his flight, and we went to one of the restaurants at the airport. Then he told me about his trip. Can the entire family treated me like I had leprosy, he sighed. They heard that I might have grid, they were still calling AIDS that back then, and believed that they could catch it if I coughed on them. I'm sure they broke all of the dishes I used and threw out any silverware and probably even burned the linens. Later, as we were walking towards the gate, I decided to make my pitch. Mark, why are you moving? I asked. You always loved San Francisco. You know you want to stay here. This would be the perfect time to jump ship and leave Victor if you want to do that. I know he's been unfaithful to you, and you don't like that. Now's your chance. Just don't get on the plane. With tears in his eyes, he moved towards the gate to get on the plane. You just don't understand were his parting words. And I didn't. There was this desolate feeling in the pit of my stomach as I watched him walk through the gate and disappear down the gangway. And disappear was the right word. On the home front, there came a time when I started noticing, but still chose not to see, that Matt's red flags were appearing with more frequency. It started after he quit his job at Bullock and Jones. To back up a little, he worked at Greyhound, and when they closed their offices, he was scrambling for a job. I informed him that I didn't want to support him, so he better get off the dime and go find new work. He applied at Bullock and Jones, one of the old San Francisco stores on Union Square. It was our version of Brooks Brothers. They needed a computer person as computers were trickling down to the smaller retail stores in the mid-80s. Since Matt had computer training from his years in the service, he got the job, and I heaved a sigh of relief. About this time, he decided to pursue his lifelong dream of getting a B.A. in music, music composition. He wanted to compose serious music. I, of course, was all encouragement as I was traveling down my own path of getting out of retail by being a designer, and I wanted to encourage him to do the same. We both would follow our bliss and all would be wonderful. This worked out for a while because Matt could take night classes and work days at Bullock and Jones. I, of course, was still working at Macy's and designing at nights and on weekends. There came a time, however, that the only classes Matt could take were day classes. He made the case to me that he could swing it with the GI Bill and his savings as it was enough to cover his half of the expenses and classes. So... I consented. What a fathead I was. Uh Uh-oh. The first thing Matt did after he quit his job was to petition the court to have his child support payments lowered because he was unemployed. The judge said something like, uh, no, if you lose a job, that's one thing, but you quit work. No. So Matt said, fuck all of them. I'll just stop paying it. That was a big red flag. I had my eyes squeezed tightly shut on that one. It is said that when someone shows you who they are, believe them. I was soon to discover, much to my dismay, that I was next. 
I would be hung out to dry in increasing degrees over the next two years as Matt contributed less and less to the household expenses and eventually stopped paying entirely. Whenever I would bring up the subject, he would go into either the I'm a great artiste and you are a commercial hack, so you should support me to absolve yourself of the guilt of hackdom spiel, or the all you think about is money, you have the heart of a cash register spiel. He never went into the I'm a lazy sack of shit who should be grateful for not being tossed out on my ass spiel. During this period, I would subject myself to Matt's student concerts. Sometimes I could convince Susan into coming with me. One time he was singing in a concert at Old First Church on Van Ness. I desperately wanted Susan to go with me, as misery loves company, but she objected to going because it was a Christian house of worship and she's Jewish. The night before, when we were ushering at the opera house, I made my big pitch. Susan, if you go to this, I have a gift I've made for you that I'll bring, but you have to promise you'll wear it. What is it? She asked suspiciously. I can't say, but you'll love it. It's a surprise, so promise? So she promised. Suspiciously, but she did. The next evening, I showed up to church with a waist-length black pont de spree lace veil, somewhat like Jackie Kennedy wore to the funeral. When I was riding on the bus to the concert, this very old San Francisco lady, complete with hat, gloves, and a handbag that looked like a fender skirt off a 59 Cadillac, was sitting next to me, and she inquired about the veil by asking sympathetically, Did somebody die? I looked at her and said, No, one of my friends is being forced to go into a Christian house of worship, and this will screen out the Christianity. I see, she said weakly and turned to look out the window. You should have heard Susan when she saw it. You want me to wear that, she shrieked. You promised. Would your mother wear this? Susan was desperately grasping at straws. I said, If my mother promised me she would wear it, she would wear it, I said, pounding my chest for emphasis. Knowing she'd been had, Susan took the veil. Laughing, she decided that it could be good training for another super role on the Opera House stage. While she was adjusting it, I explained the Christianity filtering properties of the black Pont d'Esprit veiling. As we walked into the sanctuary... Susan pulled a lace hanky out of her bag. I was impressed. How many people just happened to have lace hankies in their handbags? She daintily dabbed her eyes, and during the performance behaved like a grieving widow, sighing and dabbing. It helped that she happened to be wearing black. It really grieved her to be in a Christian house of worship. I guess that was her motivation for this particular role. Later, Matt told me that Susan was the talk of the evening, people remarked that it was so rare to see that kind of mourning these days. Then there was the time that I prevailed upon Susan and George to go with me to an experimental musical performance at a dingy place on Divisadero called The Lab. Matt was going to wear white body paint and sing, even though he couldn't remember lyrics nor carry a tune in a Gucci bag, and it was all going to be very avant-garde and on the edge. Now, Susan was always up for avant-garde. That's how I convinced her to go. This performance turned out not to be avant-garde, but more like what Susan would refer to as Shakespeare in the nude on roller skates. Well, what a disaster. First of all, I got separated from Susan and George, as it was bleacher seating, and the whole performance was the theater equivalent of a root canal with no Novocaine. Having one's fingernails pulled out with pliers would have been less painful, and coincidentally, that's what it sounded like they were doing to all the singers. I didn't hear the end of it from Susan for weeks. The student composition concerts at the college were even worse. I remember Matt premiering a piece called Sonata for Cello and Ice Cubes, really, or something to that effect. It was very atonal and experimental, the type of piece that would-be intellectuals would adore because it lacked linearity, which reads, had no melody. Melody seemed to have no place in any of these concerts. The pieces performed usually induced a migraine in either Susan or me. 
In one case, we both had simultaneous migraine from a concerto performed on an out-of-tune piano uh, recorded Wailing Cat. It was really done by synthesizer, so as not to piss off the people for the ethical treatment of animals. This was in the program notes. And a trash can played with a violin bow. Now, playing a trash can is not as melodious as playing the saw, which sounds too close to actual music. The combination of sounds in this composition also made the fillings in my teeth hurt. I do have to hand it to her, though. Through all of this, Susan was a really good sport. In the meantime, my time at Macy's was fast coming to an end. I realized that I needed to find a job in the city so I wouldn't burn through time and commuting expenses. Since I had mentally left Macy's, I didn't care anymore about what the top brass thought of me, which brings me to a social event that capped off my days at Macy's. Norma and Sharon worked at Macy's downtown in the buying offices. I can't remember what they bought, but that's not important. Norma and Sharon were loud, brassy, and loads of fun, and both were really, really stylish. Norma, Sharon, Lauren, and I would go out dancing at the Trocadero together, usually dressed around a theme. One of our theme nights was nerds. This was the only time I actually asked Matt to borrow items from his wardrobe, as he happened to have the appropriate attire. He wore it every day. Norma was engaged to this guy who we'll call Heinz because he was in a pickle and needed a green card. So they agreed to get married, hence the engagement. The wedding was set for New Year's Eve. The invitation arrived in the mail, and inside, written on a slip of red paper, were the words, Red is appropriate for a junior bridesmaid. A few days later, when I was talking to Mom on the phone, she asked what I was doing for New Year's Eve. When I told her I was going to be a junior bridesmaid in a wedding, she got real quiet. I'd never been a junior bridesmaid before. It was so exciting. Which brought up the question, what to wear? I called Lauren, who is also a junior bridesmaid. We hatched a plan and worked on our outfits far in advance. The wedding was held New Year's Eve afternoon in a little jewel box of a church on Fair Oak Street in Noe Valley. The Christmas greens were still adorning the altar. It was all very Macy's, styled to death, with the bridesmaids in gray file drop waist dresses that they would be glad to wear again, and all the men were in mourning coats. Very tasteful, very understated, very correct. Lauren and I walked in, and all heads turned. I had chosen a red wool jacket, white wing collar shirt with black bow tie, black wool pleated trousers, black evening shoes, black kid gloves, and a very Edith head, black felt beret topped with an oversized matching felt bow, complete with a red beekeeper veil. For you fashion impaired people, that means the veil completely covered my face all the way down to my chin. Lauren was similarly dressed. His chapeau was really anti-mame, consisting mainly of a big red velvet bow hovering over a cloud of red tulle veiling. Right then, Lauren almost lost his nerve and tried to sit in the back, but I kept hold of his arm with my grip of death and hissed to him in a stage whisper, God damn you, Donna Louise, we've come this far. You are not backing out now. Arm in arm, we marched right up to the front and sat down directly behind the family who had come from Kentucky for the event. Norma's father turned around to see what the commotion was all about and froze when he spotted me sitting down directly behind him. Ken King, glad to meet you, sir, I said in as hearty and manly a voice as I could summon. I grabbed his hand and gave it a good manly shake as well, while still wearing my gloves. Then I introduced Lauren, as Lauren, not Donna Louise, who said, charmed, I'm sure. The music started and the procession began. It was certainly funny watching the wedding procession as everyone in it wanted to turn and look, but couldn't because that would be uncool. I think it was all they could do to get through the ceremony without turning backward and looking. It seemed the priest was rushing everything, and it all ended rather quickly. Lauren and I were quite the hit at the reception. We got to try to catch the bouquet with the senior bridesmaids and to pose in all the photos of the wedding party. Since most of the people there were from the Macy's main offices, I completely wrecked any chance I might have had for career advancement had I wanted it. For years after, when I would run into one or another of these people, they would say, 
aren't you the one pointing to their head? I made a fashion discovery that day, and it is why men don't wear veils. It's the facial hair. I had a beard at the time, and that damn veil stuck to it like Velcro. I kept in contact with Mark over the phone since he was now determinedly making the best of things in Southern California. I was busy with my career, working, and trying to get a design business off the ground. As I said, I had decided to make cocktail hats inspired by the dust masks. So, I undertook to create my first collection and made it my official second job. Every evening at 7 o'clock, I would go into my room and work for a few hours. Between Matt and the work and my hat collection, I didn't have much time to travel south, and Mark didn't travel north. So our friendship became what I call a telephone friendship. Mark and Vic never seemed to be really happy from what I could see or hear the entire time I knew them. There came a time in our telephone friendship when the bulk of my phone conversations with Mark seemed to consist of him talking about Victor and me saying, poor, poor dear. The proportion was three to one, three calls complaining of horrible treatment to one call bragging about improvement in behavior. It was something I took as a matter of course, irritating as it was. He didn't seem to hear anything I was saying, but I was used to that. I didn't worry much about it as I was working on getting my little business going. Towards the end, I had left Macy's in Pleasanton to work for the Emporium in Stonestown in San Francisco. The Emporium paid more than Macy's, which was a prestige job. The increase in pay, combined with the lack of commuting expenses, gave me more money to put to my new business. I used to say that the Emporium was built on an ancient Indian burial ground, and the land was cursed because of it. There were so many strange occurrences there to back my theory. The first encounter I had with the curse was when I was working at Roost Brothers all those years ago. The Stonestown Roost Brothers store was directly across the breezeway from the Emporium. This was when it was still an open-air mall. I was installing Christmas windows one sunny fall afternoon when I heard an enormous crash and felt the ground shake. I had my back to the glass and thought we were having an earthquake. I got out of the window in a hurry. The crash I had just heard was caused by a 50-foot by 50-foot section of brick facing that just let loose and dropped off the facade of the Emporium with no warning whatsoever. Thankfully, nobody was underneath at the time, which was a miracle. This breezeway led to the bus stop. The window I was trimming was destroyed a few hours later when the fire department started chipping away at the remnants of the brick facade. A big chunk of brick hit the ground bounced up, and crashed right through the window, destroying the window and my new display. There wasn't a word of it in the press. I heard the Emporium paid a lot to hush it up. Mark was smart enough to blackmail the Emporium into completely remodeling both banks of our display windows, complete with new props, lighting, and everything. This incident did hit the press in OKC, where Mom asked me about it. I decided not to tell her how close I was to the scene of the crash. She was so nervous that something dreadful would happen, being so far away and all, that she would have had an absolute conniption fit. I saw more weird things happen when I started working at the Emporium, like the old, operative word old, woman who went to the cosmetics department for a facial and a makeover and didn't wake up when it was over. The clerk at the counter never thought she'd lose a customer that way. The old gal looked so natural, you know, like she was sleeping. Another example... There were three or four employees who announced their retirements and then died from cancer within a few weeks shy of collecting their pension. After I left there, I had friends working there who would keep me apprised on the latest goings-on. The weirdest one I heard was from my friend Eric. He called me one day, sounding extremely freaked out. You know your theory about the Emporium curse, he started. And the story tumbled out. A car blew up in the parking lot, taking out a car on either side. It was like the movies, you know, a big Hollywood fiery blast. Everyone thought that was, well, really unusual. 
Then, as Eric was going to the employee exit, which was through the furniture department, he passed a guy going the opposite way. The guy sat down on a sofa on one of the main traffic aisles and took out a gun and blew his brains out. Still hardened from the experience of working there, I commented, well, you know he wasn't gay or he would have done it at Macy's. No self-respecting queen would be caught dead at the Emporium. It seems the car that blew up was the suicide guy's, and he had a small arsenal in the trunk. He apparently was one of those radical, militant militia types we were starting to hear about. The Emporium paid dearly to keep that story out of the papers as well. The one thing they didn't do, however, was to paint the wall. It was splattered with blood and bits of brains for months, and I saw it the next time I visited. In the next episode, Ken escapes from the Emporium. Thanks for listening. I'd like to thank BearWorldMagazine.com for sponsoring this podcast. You can subscribe to the podcast on iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, Spotify, and Google Play. If you have questions or comments, you can reach me through the website, which is AllGrownUpNow.com. You can follow me on Instagram and Twitter at Kenneth D. King, on Facebook at Kenneth D. King Design, or on my main website, KennethDKing.com.